So, there was this movie I was planning to check out around about Halloween last year, but life happened, and I didn't end up watching it in time, and then it kind of fell off my radar, which is a damn shame, because honestly, Netflix failed Wendell and Wild. Like, the director of Coraline working on a movie with Jordan Peele, with Keegan-Michael Key and Angela Bassett in the voice cast, this thing should have been everywhere. But better late than never, I suppose. The first thing I gotta say about this movie, the music, it's so good. It's this mix of perfectly atmospheric with both diegetic and non-diegetic vocal tracks. And of course, there are times when diegetic music turns non-diegetic, which is one of my favorite things ever. The animation is also fantastic. It's very stylized, even beyond the fact that it's a stop-motion movie. The world the artists here created is alive with detail and interesting visuals some of which are mildly nauseating, but that works for the tone it's trying to set, so I'm not complaining. One tiny little criticism I do have, though, is that some of the voice acting felt a little bit clunky in places. Not to an unbearable level, but definitely to a point where I noticed something felt off. If there is one major critique I have for this movie, though, it's simply that it didn't have enough time to properly flesh out everything it wanted to touch on. It's the story of Kat, who lost her parents when she was eight in a car accident she blames herself for. At some point after that, she maybe accidentally killed at the very least seriously injured a kid who was bullying her and ended up in the juvenile system. She's being shipped off to a religious boarding school for a project seeking to give her a new chance at life, where she discovers she's something called a Hell Maiden, and makes a deal with a pair of demon brothers to raise her parents from the dead. It's also a story about said demon brothers. Wendell and Wilde live in some corner of hell, presumably, where their father, Buffalo Belzer, has a fairground for tortured souls. But they want to build something different, something people actually want to come to. To say their relationship with their father is strained would be a massive understatement. He acts less like a father to them and more like a tyrant, to the point where they start the film imprisoned on his orders. In his nose. Just roll with it, this movie gets weird. It's, to a lesser extent, a film about Raoul a trans boy who goes to the same all-girls school Kat's being shipped to. He tries his best to befriend her when she arrives, even after she tries to push him away. His mother is investigating a fire that burned down Kat's father's old brewery, which she thinks was set purposefully by the Claxons, the owners of a private prison company who have been slowly choking the life out of the small town of Rustbank, because they want to demolish it and build a prison. Raoul, meanwhile, has spent the entire winter creating a massive art project over every single roof in town. It's a secret tool that will help us later. Through Raoul and Kat, it's also a story about Siobhan, the Claxon's daughter. She's a popular girl, and she used to be, but is no longer friends with Raoul since he came out. Not, as far as I can tell, out of genuine malice, but rather because she hasn't been able to fully wrap her head around the fact that Raoul is, well, Raoul, and being around someone like that can be exhausting. Her story involves discovering the truth of how horrible her parents' business is, and the school-to-prison pipeline, after Kat makes her confront that she doesn't actually know anything about it. But it's also a story about Sister Helly, one of the nuns at the school, and another Hell Maiden, who was previously tricked by the janitor Manberg into summoning demons so he could add them to his collection. Which ties back in with our demonic duo, because, as it turns out, all those demons Manberg's been keeping in jars are Wendell and Wilde's older siblings. 
and the reason Belzer is the way he is, is because all of his previous children have gone missing. Not a justification for his actions, but an explanation. Unfortunately, there's just too much here for the runtime the movie is working with. It has the bones of a great story, but because they only have one hour and 45 minutes to tell it, it comes across very rushed in places, especially the relationship between Wendell and Wilde and their dad. Apparently it's based on an unreleased book, and it's kind of funny how clearly I can see that now that I know it. It feels like an adaptation that had too much material to work with, but couldn't afford to cut any because the story would fall apart without it. This movie needed more time than it had. Which is a pity, because what it did have was good. Just not as good as it could have been. But let's actually talk about what is there. Beyond the central themes of how the system is broken and the school-to-prison pipeline, I want to specifically talk about Raoul and Manberg. Raoul because he's trans, and Manberg because he's disabled. Now, I will freely admit that, embarrassingly, I did not realize Raoul was trans until the movie slapped me in the face with the fact the first time I watched it. Despite the fact that he's a boy going to an all-girls school. In my defense, the first time I watched this movie, it was 3am and I was more than a little sleep deprived. Meaning, yes, I realized he was trans when Siobhan deadnamed him. And then realized that he went to an all-girls school and immediately wanted to bang my head against my desk because clearly my brain wasn't working. As far as trans representation goes, Raoul is, in my opinion, great. His transness is very much part of his character. It permeates his life in ways both big and small. He tried to be the hyper-feminine popular girl in an effort to suppress his identity. He lost friends after he came out, his mother has to defend him, he's the only boy at an all-girls school. I guess kudos to this Catholic school for being trans-positive enough that the teachers refer to him by his name, and he gets to wear an altered version of the uniform? I'm betting the fact that his mother is a lawyer has something to do with that. She seems like the type of parent to go to bat for her kid. <laughs> but while Raoul's transness is very much there and undeniable, it's also not all he is. He's an extremely talented artist, he's kind, and he's lonely. He's just a kid trying to find his place in the world, and maybe a friend who might understand him. I especially love the scene where he comes out to Cat. On the one hand, he kind of can't be in the closet because of the environment he's in, but on the other, there's a difference between leaving things unspoken and directly addressing something. Raoul's looks like this. Ah, uh, wow. You were a poodle too. I tried to be, but... It's so... chill. It's part of his history that he's sharing with her, the way you might share what you got up to in middle school. While there might be some nervousness, he's trusting her with this, and trusting that bringing it up instead of leaving it unspoken won't ruin things. It's a very small moment, but I love it a lot. I also love his response here, I tried to be. Because, yeah, that checks. I personally didn't go the route of trying to be hyper-feminine before coming to terms with who I was, but that's not an uncommon experience among trans men. And finally, his secret project where he's been painting a giant mural over all of the roofs in town is what de-escalates the situation when Buffalo Belzer comes topside to retrieve his sons. That's not relevant to him as a trans character, but I figured I'd tell you how his art project ties into the plot. It's also what makes Belzer explain his missing kids, and this is where we pivot to Manberg. Manberg the Merciless. The school's janitor and secret demon hunter, who I guess we're supposed to see as somewhat okay because he gave Belzer back his kids in the end, but here's the deal. Manberg isn't your typical demon hunter. 
he specifically used Sister Helly to summon demons so he could keep them in jars. She's got more than a little bit of a point in the Blink and You'll Miss It scene where she calls it entrapment. He's not dealing with demons as they crop up and banishing them back to their homes. He's going out of his way to remove them from those homes and stuff them into absolutely inhumane conditions. In case it wasn't obvious, I'm not exactly a fan. He is a child-stealing, manipulative horror show of a human being. Like, yeah, they're demons, but they're still sapient beings. He also has no apparent qualms about using a child to continue his messed up little hobby, or potentially killing a child when he deems her too far gone. Granted, he didn't know that the demons he was collecting had any family, and he let them go the moment he realized, but still, he's... a lot. Definitely a character, is all I'll say. How his disability is represented, though? That's actually pretty decent. I don't think I've ever seen a wheelchair user in media use one of those reach extender thingies before. Which is a shame, because they can be quite handy. I don't know how to feel about the fact that he's got prosthetic feet just sitting on his footrests, but I can see why he might do that. People tend to get weird about amputees without prosthetics, so it could be something he does to avoid unnecessary and invasive comments. His wheelchair itself is definitely not ideal, but he's also a blue-collar worker in a small, dying town in the United States, so it's not exactly surprising that he wouldn't be able to afford anything better. I don't know if it's because this is stop-motion, so the animators literally had to move him, but the way he is animated and interacts with his environment also feels very natural. And from what I can tell, most of the places he finds himself in are either manageable or have actually been made accessible. I'm just going to assume that the school has an elevator, because otherwise they'd need a second janitor for everything above the ground floor. Also because I think they have to have one, legally speaking. The only slightly squint-worthy moment, I believe, is the part where he's at the lookout point with everyone else, but I'm just going to assume someone helped him up those stairs. Lastly, though, apparently, according to the end credits art, he may be Jewish. And, well, given the fact that a pretty central point of his character is literally stealing children away from their family, albeit unknowingly, that feels iffy. I guess it's a little bit of a trope inversion, because the kids in question are about as far from good little Christian children that you can possibly get, and Manberg isn't even aware that they've got family, but I'm not Jewish, so I can't say if that's enough to counteract the fact that the apparently only Jewish character is a serial kidnapper. <laughs> but that's about all I've got for you today. Wendell and Wilde was a movie with potential, but not enough time to really flesh out all it was working with. Which is honestly a real pity. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye!